Let's uh, get into the book of Matthew, chapter 6. And uh, we're going to start in verse 26. And before, or as we're getting into it, I um, want to do, do a little quiz to see if anybody could tell me what the first a cappella song to hit the Billboard's 100 chart was. Anybody? Um, was that a... Oh, the, that was you thinking? Okay. All right, I'll give you a little hint. It has something to do with what we're going to talk about today. Yes, very good. Can you say that loud so everybody can hear? Okay, can you do a little, um, sing it? Uh, okay. Don't worry, be happy. I'm sure you're all thinking that song if you haven't heard it. It's very catchy. It was the first song to hit, uh, acapella song to hit the charts, uh, Billboard 100 charts. But what's interesting, it only lasted two weeks on the chart. I find that very interesting because... Probably what a lot of you, a lot of me, it was in 1988, you might have found out that as many times as you sing that song, you can't just be happy. You can, there's not a happy switch. There's not a thing just to turn on and be happy. Especially when he talks about don't worry. How do we not worry? Well, the thing is, Jesus actually gives us the solution to worry. So that's what I want to talk about this morning. But just a couple things to wet your whistle, so to speak. There's a Jewish proverb that says, Worms eat you when you're dead, and worries eat you when you're alive. And then uh, another church father, Annan, said this, Don't tell me that worry doesn't do any good. I know better. The things I worry about, they never happen. And then another guy, 500 years ago, Montaigne, he said, My life has been filled with terrible misfortune, most of which never happened. Another said, Worry is like a small trickle of fear that meanders through the mind until it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. And another said, Worry is like a dark room where the negatives are developed. Uh, statistics show us that 85% of uh, subjects worried about never happen. And with the 15% that did happen, 79% of subjects discovered either they could handle the difficulty better than expected, or the difficulty taught them a lesson worth learning, which means 97% of what you worry over is not much more than fearful, your fearful mind punishing you with exaggerations and misrepresentations. So worry is a, a real issue. It's a real thing, probably right now. And I'd actually like to ask you as we go through this uh, to be thinking about what is it that you're worried about? And you may say, I got hundreds of things. Well, just pick one. Because we're going to actually work through this with that worry and we're going to learn how the Bible tells us that we can actually deal with it and handle it. Now these instructions, these provisions are the provisions given to the believer. These are a Christian's pro uh, priority. This is a Christian's privileges. This is the blessings that you get when you become a Christian, you may be say, saying, man, I just didn't want to go to hell. I just wanted my sins forgiven. Well, now that you're a child of God, now all these provisions have come to your life. And we're going to see that today in the scriptures. So the title of the message is Don't Worry. And we're going to look at five reasons in the text that we are given by Jesus for us not to worry. So, verse 25, chapter 6. He says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, 
what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more for clothing? So point number one, if you're taking notes, the first reason not to worry is the kingdom. This is what Jesus is saying. The first reason is the kingdom. Notice he starts off this section. He says what? Yay, you got it. He says, therefore. So why does he say that? He's connecting something, isn't he? You guys following? So here's, here's what Jesus is doing. He, he's basically concluding what he just said. What did he just say? Well, you, you remember last week, we talked about Jesus saying not to lay up treasures for ourselves on earth, but instead lay them up in heaven. So he's distinguishing two different worlds, two different kingdoms, two different things, two different ways in which we can live or two different things we can live for. And he's making that distinction. And then he says the lamp of the body is the eye. And what Jesus was saying is that when we have a sight or a vision, when, when we look at life through a singular lens of Jesus Christ, when we look at life that way, Instead of looking at life like I want to go to heaven and I want to be rich and I want to have this and I want Jesus and I want the world and that sort of thing brings a certain darkness to a person's life. But what he's saying is to have a, a singular focus on the Lord. Sort of not be double-minded, not be all over the place with, uh, with all the things that we want. So that's what he's saying then. We finish with him saying we can't serve two masters. And he was talking about materialism and worldly things and God. And he, he even made the statement that when we're loving one, we're hating the other. So in other words, you can't blend our masters. You can't blend your devotion and your worship. It's either going to be one or the other. So we bring on much of our worry through our connection or association with the things of the world. Improper connection or improper association with worldly things brings about stress and worry. So that's why he's saying, therefore, he's concluding the fact that we can't live both ways the two are opposite, the world system and the heavenly kingdom. Let's go back a little further. Jesus starts out the Sermon on the Mount saying, these are the things of the kingdom of heaven. He starts off talking about a different realm, a different thing, and he calls it the kingdom of heaven, the same idea. And then he begins to explain what are the characteristics of one who is living for a spiritual kingdom, a heavenly kingdom, a divine kingdom. And then he goes on and explains how that actually looks practically to where that we can actually do religious things, but yet if the inward part of us is not really worshiping God and devoted to God, then we can get into just external performance and not really being worshipful of God because that happens inside of us. So now what Jesus, as he transitions, he says, therefore, because of all that, here's what I'm saying. So he's concluding. Here's what I'm saying. Don't worry about your life. That word worry is very interesting. That, worry, that word worry, the original word in the Greek, it means to divide. To be drawn in different directions. And, and so that's what worry is. So we, now we have a definition, a working definition, a biblical working definition of worry. And that's being 
pulled in two different directions. You know, it's interesting, the word anxiety, our English word anxiety, comes from the stem or the root of that word is to strangle, to be strangled. And the English word fret, F-R-E-T, that comes from a word that means to devour or eat. And so now we have this understanding. I'm sure we all emotionally can relate to this. We all can get a hold of and understand if you're thinking about the thing that you're worried about right now. It's, it's strangling you. It's eating you up. It's causing you to invest a lot of emotional energy just thinking about it, wondering about it, making up scenarios, in, investing yourself, and, and it's, it's taking away from you. So Jesus says, I don't want you to be pulled all over the place. Satan uses worry, obviously, as a, as a tool to draw people away from God. He says, I don't want you to worry to be taken away, to be divided and strangled by worry. And then notice what he says. He says, in regards to our life, don't worry about your life. He says, he, he talks about eating and drinking and our body. So what he's doing now is he's he is now talking about things that can often consume much of our worry. So he's, he's talking about things and he calls them uh, things of our life. So when he talks about our life, now here's what he's saying. He's saying that our life and the material things of our life, if we don't go any further, in our life, in our devotion, in our worship, in our understanding, in our thoughts, if, if we don't take our thoughts further from the things of this life, then that's what our whole life is. And so our whole life then becomes the kingdom of this world. So what happens if our, our whole life is invested in this world, or even if you're a Christian, maybe you're inappropriately invested in this world. Maybe you really are a Christian and going to heaven and, and love Jesus, but worry is sort of like a gauge to see how much we're really invested in this world. Because Jesus is, is now explaining that our investment, our full investment, should be in our heavenly kingdom. And that's where we're not divided anymore. That's where we're not pulled anymore. That's where we're settled now. And so he, he finishes, notice what he says. He says, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? In other words, we have to take our life past this world and the material things and we have to take it to the Lord, and we can only do that by the Spirit of God. In other words, what I'm talking about today, it only, only works for somebody who's truly a Christian. To somebody who is actually in the kingdom of God, a different kingdom, it, it only works for that person. It only works for the person who can truly say there's something greater beyond this, that the Lord is truly their Savior. It, it only works for them. And so what, 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 if, what if you're not a Christian? How do you deal with worry? Well, a lot of people deal with worry in very unhealthy ways. That's, uh, that's why there are so many addictions and so many problems, because worry consumes and strangles. It's hard to live like that. And so the flesh has a tendency to run, to find some comfort somewhere, some way, just to find some relief. So this first point, it comes down to this. The, the first reason that you and I, if you're a believer, truly a believer, that you shouldn't 
worry is because of the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is where we live, even though we exist in this world. Because the, the, because the kingdom of God is a place where the book of Romans says, it's not eating and drinking, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. There it is. You want to live in the kingdom of God where there's no worry and no stress? Don't be divided in your allegiances in who's controlling your life, but be controlled by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now is how we experience the kingdom of God while we're on the earth. And see, a lot of us, it takes some time maybe to learn how to walk by the Spirit. A lot of times when we first become Christians, or maybe we've, we've continued on in our Christian life in a way where it's just by our head knowledge, information. We learn, 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 and then we try to live according to all these things we learn. That's one extreme. The other extreme is we live off emotion and our feelings. And sometimes we just come out of church and we're so emotional, it feels like we're on a hoverboard as we go out of church. And then not long after, we crash and burn because something happens and our emotions aren't um, the way they were before, and now we're, we're unstable. But see, what the Lord is saying is that His kingdom for the believer, it's accessed by simply living under the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we live under the power of the Holy Spirit, we do experience the emotions of the kingdom of God, but we can't depend on that. So we rest... On the promises of God, we stand firm on what God says. So that, that means we have to be in our word. That means our, our word dictates how we live. And as we walk in obedience to God's word, now the power of the Holy Spirit is working in and through our life. And then the last thing by living by the kingdom of God, get this. Really, did you know if you're a child of God... It's possible to never have a bad day. You may say, okay, what do you have to say about that now? Here's why. Here's what I mean. That doesn't mean, you know, tomorrow my car won't start when I go to leave for work and lightning might strike my house. Or It doesn't mean that. But here's, if you're living in the kingdom of God... Every day, if, if our goal is God's will in our life, and that's what it means to live by the kingdom of God, it means our goal is His will. So every day is a great day because we could be thankful for whatever God's will is. And we know that if, if God's will is happening in our life, regardless of what the, what the circumstances may look like, do we know that His will is good? So we can never have a bad day. Every day is a good day because it's God's will. So when we live for the kingdom of God, our goal is God's will. And if it's God's will, it's always a great day. We always have something to be thankful for. So that's the first point. In order not to worry, live for the kingdom of God. And how we do that is we live for His will. Lord, Your will be done. Point number two. The second reason that we don't have to worry are the birds. <laughs> what does he say next? Look at verse 26. He says, look at the birds. Look at the birds of the air. Now this is fascinating to me. So what God does now is he pulls in his creation in the world around, he pulls in nature. And he uses that, and he wants us to consider. That word consider means to, to take some time thinking about it. To take some time to, to look and examine the bird. So, so if, you're, if you have your thing you're worried about, 
So the first thing is this, this thing, I'm submitting it to God's will. So I'm thanking God for it. And now I'm praising God for it. I'm trusting God for it. And I'm resting in it. It's God's will. God's will is good. And then the second thing is now this thing. I'm taking this thing and then I'm looking at the birds. Okay, that's not really helping me that much. So let's move further. So it says the, the birds. So look at them. Look at them and sort of study them. He, they, they don't sow or reap and they don't gather into barns. So what, what he's saying is if, if you look at the birds, study them and they're, they're giving you a message. Birds are giving you a message. I've never seen a bird driving a tractor in a cornfield. I've never seen a, a bird putting hay in a barn and building that barn up. I have birds in my backyard and I see them. They do stuff. Birds do stuff. They do a lot of stuff, but they don't have a job. They're not working at In-N-Out. They're not working at Brahms. They're not, they're not doing that. What they're do birds are doing what they do. And, and, and God's saying, with your worry, I want you to consider something. I want you to be thinking deeper thoughts, bigger thoughts. Why is that? Because a lot of times when we're worried about stuff, all we're thinking of is about that thing, right? Sometimes God has to communicate to us in different ways. So he says, so you see the birds, and, and look at them. Look how beautiful they are. Look what they're doing. They're doing activities and things. But those birds, they eat every day. Those birds are taken care of. He says, your heavenly Father feeds them. And then he says, are you not of more value than they? And then he says, which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit or 18 inches to your stature. Imagine the kind of basketball teams we could have if worry would increase our stature. It would be a whole different deal, wouldn't it? So here's the thing. So point number two. In regards to worry, we don't have to worry because of God's kingdom. We don't have to worry because of the birds and the message that the birds give us. What's the message that they give us? The message that the birds give us is that God takes care of them and we can deduce or conclude if He takes care of a little bird and yet I'm made in God's image and I have the Holy Spirit living in me and God died for me on the cross. If, if that be true, then I should be able to bridge that gap with my lack of understanding and I should be able to bridge that gap and say, God's going to take care of it. And within that, I should be able to say, I am valuable to God. If, if that spirit was taken care of, and the sparrow is going about doing his thing. And remember, what's important here is doing God's will. Because sparrows just, or birds, they just don't sit on the tree and do nothing. The key is to do the Lord's will. Walk and operate in the Lord's will. But see, sometimes we think, well, if I do the Lord's will, then I'll have to give up this. I'll have to sacrifice that. I'll have to compromise. And, and the Lord's saying... You're never going to be burned or starve or be put in a bad position, so to speak, by following the Lord's will. Remember the birds, consider the birds, and remember that you are more precious than God, to God than you could ever imagine and know. And so because of our meditation on God and our understanding of nature and how organized it is and how He takes care of its creatures, then I can say, okay, Lord, I see the birds and I see how much You love me. So whatever your thing is, whatever you're worried about, live for God's kingdom and put your thing in relationship to God's kingdom 
And secondly, as you see the birds, remember God cares for you and values you so much more and promises to take care of you. Point number three. Not only do we have the reason of the kingdom and the reason of the birds not to worry, we have now the third reason, the reason of the lilies. The flowers. The flowers tell us that we don't have to worry. Look what he says in verse 28. He says, so why do you worry about your clothing? And then he says, consider. You know what I'm getting as we read through this, as I study this? What I'm, I'm getting is that the Lord wants us to think long and hard about Him. He wants us to, to look at the birds, not just a quick, but He wants us to observe them in light of God. He wants us to see Him in, in what He's doing. He wants us to take lessons from the... But now He's saying, consider the lilies. So really look at the flowers. Think about the flowers. Think about how they look. Think about how beautiful they are. Think about the colors that are in a flower. Think about how amazing that is. He wants us to consider that. But he, he wants that to be a springboard to our relationship with Him. Don't stop at nature. A lot of us really like nature, appreciate nature. But what a tragedy to stop at nature and not see the creator of nature and the glory of God through nature and what He's done. So try that. Try that this week. Try to go out and look at, just really observe the flowers. Really look at the birds. And why not go a little further? Look at the sky. Look at the moon. Look at the stars. And draw conclusions about God. What kind of conclusions can we draw about God from what we see? Have you ever prayed, Lord, I'm not getting any answers. Can you just give me an answer to my thing? I just want an answer. And you know what? A lot of times this is what God would say. In Psalm 65, verse 5, He says, By awesome deeds in righteousness, God will answer us. You get that? In awesome deeds of righteousness, God will answer us. And you know what? The rest of the chapter goes on and it talks about creation and nature. Do you know what? Whatever that thing is you're worried about, do you know your answer is given in the awesome deeds of creation all around us? What can we learn from all these things? Through that chapter, it talks, uh, I, uh, Psalm 65, it talks about the mountains. It talks about the pastures. It talks about how the oceans are. It talks about the seas. It talks about how God is controlling all these things. He made all these things. You may not have right now the direct answer to your worry. But as you look around in creation and you see all that God did, now what you can do is say, God has timing. God has order. God has unlimited resources and God has unlimited power. And God cares about the littlest things. Even my little, little things. God cares about those things. And as I look at creation, I look at the world, and I say, man, God, you, you are amazing. The sun comes up and it goes down. I see the moon and the seasons change. And I, I can draw my answers from that. And I can come and I, and I can rest and say, Lord, what am I worried about? I don't, I don't see that, that bird having to go to, like, biofeedback to try to control his heart rate because he has so much anxiety. Birds are free, right? I love how he used the bird example. But then we look at the, the flowers. Isn't that one thing that often consumes a thought, our thoughts a lot is how, how we look, our appearance? And don't get me wrong, J. Vernon McGee said, if the barn needs painting, it's okay to paint it. That doesn't mean we have to go hyper, you know, 
I have to look terrible to be holy. And in all this, what he's saying is, don't, don't be obsessed with these things. Don't worship these things. Don't let these things dominate your life. He's saying, I'm going to take care of all those things. In other words, those things of the world are our needs, our clothing and, and our food. He, he says, focus on doing my will and you don't have to worry about those. I'm going to take care of all those things. And then he says, look at the flowers. Look how amazing those are. Consider, think about that. And then he says, um, look how they grow. They don't toil or spin. Isn't that interesting? With the flower, how many of us spend much of our life trying to toil and spin and work things and get ahead and we try to advance ourselves and climb up the ladder and, and we have to ask ourselves at the end of the day, what's it all for? Think about whatever you're doing in life and ask yourself, what is it all for? What is the point whenever we, we put our ambition above our conviction? Well, what is it all for? That the, what, that's what Jesus is trying to say. What is it all for? And, and, and look at those flowers. Look how beautiful they are. And what do they do? They're not running around and trying to knock the other guy down. And they're not trying to outgrow another person. They're just chilling out. They're just resting. It reminds me of John chapter 15. Abide in me and I in you. And basically... Just relax and don't strive after worldly ambitions, but strive after God. And what will happen is we will be, we will find, we will be adorned. We'll be clothed. Yes, physically, but even more importantly, we'll be clothed, clothed with the righteousness of God. We will be beautified by the Beatitudes. We'll be adorned with the spiritual fruit that is so amazing that the world needs. We will be attractive, not in the carnal, secular way, which some of you are very attractive, but be that as it may. That's not what it's all about. We will be adorned in heavenly righteousness and we will be attractive to the world. God says, I want to beautify you with these qualities, these characteristics. I want to give you my beauty. And so he's saying, draw these conclusions. Look at the flowers. It would be am amazing. And I, I don't know, some of you, if you are nature lovers, nature people. But he's saying, if we spent, if we spent more time looking, studying, and drawing conclusions from nature around us than we would on things that really don't matter, say social media. Imagine the hours we spend in front of a screen instead of looking at creation and nature. Have you ever thought how crazy that is? And I'm, I'm saying me too. I'm not just saying you guys are all... I'm saying me. Think about how crazy that is. We would rather watch something fake than experience something real. That is crazy. And God has, has given us all these things to enjoy. And yet so often we want to spend time enjoying things that actually sow or foster our worry, our anxiety. So it's like a trap, isn't it? So what does he say next? Look at verse 29. He gives the example of Solomon. He says, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these, like one of these flowers. Solomon the, at his time was the richest man that ever lived. And he was known for how he was, how he was looking, what he would wear, his, his palace, everything was like top notch, full bore, over the top. And he said with, with Solomon doing all of that, he said, the lily, look at the lily compared to that. And then he said, in verse 30, he says, Now, if God so clothes, clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, 
Oh, you of little faith. So here's the thing. It's interesting to me the tenderness and the love and the care that Jesus had for people and for his disciples. But it seems like when it came to the issue of faith, it seemed like that was really astonishing to him, those with little faith. So like the disciples, they, you know, they would go across the Sea of Galilee and the storms and wind would come and they'd completely freak out. And Jesus says, what's wrong? Why are you so freaked out? Jesus, you know, being asleep in the boat. But see here, the thing is, I think the Lord is often astonished by our lack of faith. Because if you think about it, why would a believer, we truly believe God enough to be saved? Like how much do you have to believe to actually be saved, to go to heaven? You have to believe that God, the creator of everything, came to the world as a human being, as a baby, through a immaculate conception. See, that's a lot to believe, right? You have to believe that Jesus lived his life out on earth without sin, not even a thought of sin. You have to believe that Jesus died on the cross, it was buried, and then came alive again, and then was seen physically by over 500 people. You have to believe that. And then you have to believe that Jesus ascended up to heaven to the right hand of the Father and sits at the right hand of the Father. You have to believe that your sins are forgiven. You have to believe that you're going to heaven because these are all things that God said. But why can't we believe God's going to... If, if we believe that, how, how hard is it is then to believe that God's going to provide for us? How hard is it to believe that God has a plan for our life now? How hard is it to believe that all things work together for good. Do we really believe that? So this is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, now, it, this, this belief, I, I can't believe, if, if, as you've seen me, as you see all around you, there, there is things that they are very simple, but they've been convoluted. Just like in our day and age, things are very simple. Th things that we argue and debate about there shouldn't be an argument and debate. You have to, to throw out common sense. If you have to argue, if I have to convince you that I'm a boy, a male and not a female, if I have to convince you of that and argue about that, there's something wrong, isn't there? But take that a step further. If, if I have to convince you that everything that you say, we all know everything we see has been made, put together. If I have to convince you that this watch right here just automatically appeared, you would think I'm crazy. But, but the simplest thing that God created, the heavens and the earth, that we have to argue about that? I mean, it's, we, we don't argue about that with anything else. And there's a reason, and I can go down the list of these simple things that we should believe, but Satan's put these strongholds to deceive because we're in the last days and his time is short, and he's bringing a strong delusion to where people can't even believe the, the most basic things about life. And so this is what Jesus is saying. It's, it, it makes so much sense and it's so clear as you see everything that you can put your whole faith in me. That you can rest in me. So that tells me something. That tells me worry then or the lack of worry. If I'm not going to worry, it all comes down to my faith. It all comes down to what I'm going to believe. And see, if I take my thing, your thing, you take your thing, I'll take my thing, whatever we're worried about, and we will rub faith on it. Apply faith. Faith, faith is not just something we read about in a book. It has to be practical. I, ha I have to be able to take these things 
and apply it to my life, apply it to my situation. I have to be able to have faith in those things. And you know what? When we have faith and we apply our faith, it eliminates all worry. It eliminates doubt. And if I'm still confused about that, then, and I'm having a hard time with that, I can look at the birds, I can look at the flowers, and I can say, okay, I'm, I'm good. Okay, look at all that, so God's going to take care of me. Point number four of why we don't have to worry is the Father. Look what he says next in verse 31. He gives us another therefore. So everything I just talked about, now he's concluding the conclusion. Therefore, don't worry. Can we just stop there? We should be able to. We should be able to just say, okay, go home, live our life this week and be good. But I think Jesus knows our frame, our weakness. He knows, okay, let's get a little more. Let's make it really clear. Let's, let's just anchor this. Let's once and for all, let's change this thing. Because since 1988 and that song, Don't Worry, Be Happy, has come out, people haven't not worried and people haven't been more happy. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, I can put a nail in this coffin of worry once and for all. So let's keep going a little bit. But I want to ask you, are you still going to let your worry linger? Because what I'm getting here, what I'm, what I'm seeing is that God has given us an option. He's given us an option to worry. He's given us that option. So, and He's kind of given us a responsibility, it sounds like, that we have, we have a responsibility not to worry if we're a Christian. So now He's given us a responsibility. Now, a lot of times, we, don't we think about religion or God in, in this thing where, like, this huge bummer, this huge, like, my life's going to be ruined and I'm going to be a martyr my whole life and everything's going to be terrible. And Jesus is saying, hey, don't worry. Jesus is commanding us not to worry. And whenever Jesus, is, Jesus commands us to do something, He gives us the enablement. How great is that? And, and another thing, Jesus commands us to rejoice in the Lord. How great is that? So, so we give our life to Christ, and now we don't have to worry anymore. That's a pretty good deal. So Jesus is very good at and made provision for how we live our life here. It's not just we're on our own here, and then we get to heaven if we make it. It's like, no, I've prepared a place for you in heaven, and I've given you provision to live your life on earth fully and abundantly, completely. So watch this. He says in verse 32, he says, For after all these things the Gentiles seek. What is he talking about? Eating, drinking, the stuff we're wearing. Do you get that? He says that's, that's what the, what he's saying is that's what somebody who's not a believer. That's how they live their life. So what does this tell us? This tells us that now there's something completely different. That tells us that the, in the economy of the kingdom of God, worry doesn't exist. Do you see that? That's important. Because the Bible has called us to be separate and different, not to be exactly the same. So we have to ask ourselves, are we growing and not worrying? Or are we giving ourselves permission to worry? Do we tell ourselves that that's just how I am and I worry and that's how it's going to be? Or are we coming up against it and saying, no, I need to fight this. I see the provision. I see this is not of the Lord. This is not the fruit of the Spirit. So here's the thing. Am I fighting against this? With what God has given me, am I not accepting? We can't accept worry as okay. We all worry, but we can't say that's okay. We have to say, no, that's not of God. We have to put a stop to it. And we have to then apply what God has given us. 
we have to keep battling against it. We have to keep fighting it because he says in verse 32, that's what people who don't know the Lord, they're, they're after worldly things. They're experiencing the repercussions of worldly things. He says, I don't have that for you. This is not my kingdom. So we have to ask ourselves then, are we really living for God's kingdom? That would be the question. He says, for your heavenly Father, He knows what you need, that you need all these things. And he says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. One of the most amazing scriptures to me, the most practical scriptures to me in all the Bible, and it's the priorities that a believer has are to put their energies in life into seeking God. And remember, worry is being divided, being pulled in two directions. And I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you and say, you know what? Make this one scripture yours. Make this what you're all about. Make this what your life is all about. What? To seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Do you know what he says? He says, now I'll take care of everything else. Seeking God in His righteousness means that, that we're seeking God practically. We're putting our energy into God, into our relationship with God. And as we put our energies into our relationship with God, what He's saying is, I'm going to take care of all that stuff. I'm going to take care of all your provisions and everything you need, but I don't want that to be a thing that you're carrying around. I want that to be a thing that I can carry around so that the thing you carry around is this ambition and passion to follow hard after me. That's what I want. So God's taken everything off the table. God doesn't want us to be all divided. He doesn't want us to have multiple allegiances. He doesn't want us to be pulled around by selfish ambition and vain conceit. What He wants us to do is get to the place where all that matters is God to us. <coughs> and we're living for the kingdom. We're looking at the birds. We're looking at the lilies. And we're saying He's taking care of all of that. And we're looking at now He's my heavenly Father. And now I can come to Him, I can rest in Him, I can trust Him, and because of all that, now my life is completely free to follow Him with everything I got. And when we do that, the last point is this. Another therefore, it's concluding the conclusion to the conclusion. So he puts that all together, and this is it. This is what it comes down to. He says... Another, don't worry. Do not worry. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. What if we just did that? What if we just cut the cord to tomorrow and just live for today? And what if today we sought God and let Him take care of the rest of the thing? That's what He's saying. Do you know that 90% of our thoughts are on past troubles or future anxieties. And did you know from Gerontologist Magazine, they report on a study, it says this, this is a recent study, it says, depression is associated with the reduced expectancy of, a po of positive future, expectation of positive future events. Sorry, I messed that up. Depression is associated with a reduced expectancy of positive future events. You get that? So a study, we know this, this is obvious, but then there's a study that came out that when we don't think the future is positive or there's something positive in the future, we get depressed. That's called hope, isn't it? That means I don't have any hope anymore. That means when I wake up in the morning and I look, look forward, I, I don't see anything good there. And that shouldn't be so for the child of God. The child of God has the ultimate hope, the ultimate future, the ultimate knowledge and understanding of good to move forward 
And we know that because God's good, that He's our Father, that we can look around and see how He works good in the earth. And our good is associated with the good, good Father who loves us and proved His goodness to us by dying on the cross for us. So the message this morning then is you and I are called to be different. And this is one of the areas of life that we can be so different. That we can be so changed. And when we come to a place, if we can all agree first that we worry is not what God has for us. And then we can see that God has provided the way out for us. That you and I have the power of the Holy Spirit. The power that raised Jesus from the dead. How powerful is that? That's what you and I have within us to stop worrying. In this section of Scripture, four times Jesus says, don't worry. Four times in this little section, He really wants to impress this upon us. And you know what? We can really do it because He's done it. And we need to stop this. We need to put a halt on this. And we need to have the fruit of the Spirit working in and through our life powerfully in an amazing way for ourselves and for the world to see the power of Jesus Christ working in and through our life, especially in difficult times. Jesus loves you. Rest on that. He proved His love for you. Don't worry about tomorrow. Enjoy the Lord today. And then tomorrow, enjoy the Lord tomorrow. And do that all the way until you stand before Jesus Christ one day. And He says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for this morning. And I thank You, Lord, that You, you make provision for us in every way, Lord. And especially in a way that a lot of us struggle with, Lord. And a lot of us have plenty to worry about. And Satan knows that he can bring to us plenty of things to worry about. And so, Lord, we know that that's part of his strategy. Lord, I pray for our congregation. I pray that you would give us... Everything that we need to live an abundant life, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that you died so that we don't have to worry. I thank you that you settled the ultimate question. And that is where we will spend eternity. Lord, I pray for anybody here who may be worried about what's going to happen when they die. I pray for anybody here this morning that is possibly concerned about eternal life, about their sin, about heaven and hell. And I thank you, Lord, that you've made this provision so we don't have to worry about the biggest thing in life. And so, Lord, I just want to pray for anybody here. If you're here this morning and, and you would like to know that you are going to heaven when you die. If you're here today and you would say, you know, I want to go to heaven. I want to be forgiven. I want to know God personally. Then you can. The Bible tells us that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is separation from God for all eternity. And yet God demonstrated His love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that whoever would believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and rose again from the dead, that they would be saved. 
And so if that's you this morning, if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, if you want to be forgiven of your sins, if you want to know you're going to heaven, I want to give you that opportunity now to pray and put your faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And as you pray, you pray this to the Lord, not to anybody else. You pray it from your heart and you pray it sincerely. This is a matter that's between you and God. So I want to give you that opportunity to talk to Him. Ask for His forgiveness. And ask Him to fill you with the Holy Spirit. So, pray with me. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And Lord, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And now, Lord, I put my faith in you. I thank you. I ask you to have mercy on me, Lord. I believe that you died for me and rose again from the dead. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and help me to walk with you all the days of my life. And you know what? Before we stop praying here, I want to pray also for you here this morning that, that may be just really struggling with worry. I asked you to think about something that you're worried about. And I want to pray for you about that. I want to ask that the Lord would take that burden. I, I'm going to just ask that, that right now you'd surrender that thing to the Lord, that it would be His problem and not your problem. That you just rest in His promises. That you'd be free to seek Him without all these webs and entanglements. If, if that's you, just as we're praying here, just acknowledge before God, Lord, I'm worried. I'm consumed by this thing. Lord, it's, it's hard. I can't stop thinking about it. And Lord, I'm going to come before you now and I want, you to, I want to ask that you would help me. If you're, if you're here this morning wanting to definitively surrender something particular to the Lord, let's just do that right now. Let's take it off your plate. So acknowledge that before the Lord right now. Whatever it is to say, Lord, I'm having a hard time with this and I want to surrender this to you now. nothing on your plate except for the Lord. Just let the Lord be on your plate, nothing else. Just give it to the Lord, whatever it is. The Lord, as those are those that are surrendering their struggles to you now, their worries to you now. I pray, Lord, that there would be great freedom. That there would be nothing on their plate except for you, Lord. I pray that there would be no anxiety and worry. But instead, you would replace it with peace and joy. I pray, Lord, for all of us, as we surrender our worry to you, that that we would be vigilant about not making provision for worry, not allowing it to fester, not allowing it to rule, not allowing it to dominate, not allowing it to control. But instead, Lord, we would seek you. We would turn it over to you. We would continue to turn it over to you. I pray for any strongholds that Satan's had in people's lives here, Lord. That you'd break those strongholds, that they would take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, Lord. And I pray that we would now use our energy and our strength to seek you with all of our heart, 
mind, soul, and strength. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.